God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here on Zoom with uh, Christ Presbyterian Church. Uh, we have a couple of announcements for the good of the community, for the good of the whole. Tom, did you want to go first? And I think you have to unmute yourself. I, I just did, and I certainly can go first. So uh, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Good to see all the smiling faces. I know it's been a long time. Um, so uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes of your time here to introduce a, an upcoming uh, survey that we're going to be doing. Um, about six weeks ago, maybe two months ago, I was asked by uh, a, a couple people to help uh, lead a, um, a four-person team, which one of them is myself, to uh, conduct a congressional assessment tool. It's a survey, short name for it is the CAT. Um, we, are, uh, we did this about five years ago. So some of you will recall, it's an online survey. Uh, teammates that helped me with it were Max and Bonnie and Nyambi. So we've been working every week, coming together with this stuff and pulling together what we hope is gonna be a, a good survey for you all that will give us a lot of insight about uh, how the, church has been doing, how we, uh, you know, where we think we could go in the future and basically help our leadership conduct some, uh, you know, they can make some uh, critical decisions on, on the church's future. Uh, this survey is going to take, it, it's long, I, you know, I got to admit, it's going to take you at least uh, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, you know, nobody likes surveys, especially me, I get it, uh, but it's important. And it's important that we hear from each and every one of you individually, not as a family, not one per family household, but everybody. So uh, you know, what we're going to do here is send out a, a survey link. I think it's called Survey Monkey. Some of you may have been familiar with that. Uh, where, and we're not going to start for a while yet. We still have a few weeks. But you'll get uh, a few announcements similar to what we're doing here. Uh, you know, at meetings, there's going to be email announcements on the Tuesday emails. There's going to be periodic, uh, you know, on the Sunday services. Next week, uh, Nyambi or Max will, uh, or Bonnie will uh, beat the drum on this again as well, just to remind people. And it's all because it's important. It's important about our future. Um, based on those survey answers, we're going to get that unbiased view of our strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and a recommendation from the unbiased experts on where we could take CPC next. So it's gonna measure some of our satisfaction um, and it's also gonna help us prepare for our pastoral search. So uh, it, it's really uh, pretty critical here that we do it. Um, let me see, sorry, I got some notes here. I wanna make sure I'm not uh, being redundant. Yeah, so start time is uh, on or about 18 April. So uh, it's we chose that because it's post Easter. It's post uh, the initial tax season. I don't know if the tax uh, tax has been extended or not, but um, 18 or 19th. The 18th is a Sunday. The 19th is a Monday. I don't know if they'll send it out on uh, you know which day, but basically you'll get a, a mail in the a letter in the mail advising you of this, that it's coming. And then on the day that it's released, you're gonna get an email with a link and you hit the link. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you that from over 3000 of these things that have been done by Holy Cow, um, they prefer, and it's a lot easier, everything's shown that it's a lot easier to do it uh, via email or via the link on the internet. So some of you may be adverse to that. If you are, we have hard copies too. It's just they've had less success with the hard copies because people tend to skip questions and they tend to just, you know, put it aside and never mail it back. Whereas, uh, you know, at one sitting, take 30 minutes and, you know, it, you can go through these pretty quick. It's not fill in the blanks. It's agree to strongly disagree um, on your answers and just see how our progress is. So uh, if you have questions, reach out to myself, Nyambi, uh, Max, or Bonnie, and we can try and answer, uh, 
answer the questions or we can look it up and find out. But um, I think it's going to be a good thing for the church and it's going to reach out to those of you who maybe you're a little bit more introverted and you're not willing to bring it up with session, uh, some of these points. So this is, this is your chance. And that is all I have, Megan. That's great. Thank you, Tom. Um, so as Tom mentioned, um, it's primarily online, but there is the paper option for because we do have some members that are not online. They don't have computers or they don't have email. So um, don't worry about your friends that might not have computers, that we're missing them. We will be sure to include them. Um, the announcements that I have um, today is Palm Sunday. We start our um, Holy Week today. It's Holy Week is the most intense and theologically important time of the year. Ibina, are you watching the, the waiting room? Um, so today, so we begin today with worship on Palm Sunday and then Thursday at 7.30, we will have a Maundy Thursday service, which is where we remember the institution of the Lord's Supper. And then on Good Friday, we will have a, um, a service where we remember the passion of our Lord. And then we rejoin again to close worship on Easter Sunday. So that Thursday, Friday, Sunday is one continuous worship service. Uh, I think that's it. Are there any other announcements for the good of the whole? Raise your hand. I have a message from, huh, oh, okay, gotcha. All right, so people are out of the waiting room. It's just an artifact on my screen. Good. Thanks, Bina. Doing great. All right, and with that, let us prepare our hearts to worship our God in spirit and in truth. have a new organist for serving this person.
Please join me in the call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let us join our voices singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Because if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is loving and just will remove our unrighteousness from us as far as the East is from the West. So let us confess together. Our temptations, O oh Lord, are the very tests that came to you to be relevant, to be powerful, to be spectacular. We may not be asked to turn stones into bread or to control vast kingdoms or to throw ourselves down from a tall spire. And yet your temptations are the very ones that we face where we have listened to other voices, forgive us. Where we have sought the right. applause of others, forgive us. Where we have worshiped other gods, forgive us. Give us purity of heart and clarity of vision. Help us hear your voice, to see your kingdom and its righteousness, to worship you alone. My friends, the proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So let us proclaim the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Uh, so I wanna have a word 
for the children and for the simpler thinkers among us. Today is Palm Sunday and we don't have greenery. We don't have green palms to wave, but we all have palms of our hands to wave. And um, I was at a, a witness yesterday where people were waving. They were waving from their cars and the people that were on the sidewalk were waving. And it was a lot like, you know, you do that at a parade too. Like you, you wave to the people that are parading and it's a way of communicating. Um, so this will be our palms for Palm Sunday this year. And it reminded me of a finger prayer that I wanna share with everyone. So if you take your hand and you turn it sideways so that your thumb is pointing toward you, you pray first for the ones you love because they are closest to you. Then you pray for the teachers who show you the way. Then you pray for, this is our tallest finger. The middle finger is the tallest finger. So then we pray for our leaders who govern us, who are in charge of everything. And then fourth, you might not know this, but the ring finger is the weakest of our fingers. And so for the ring finger, we remember the weakest among us. So people who are sick or vulnerable or suffering in some way. And then finally, the pinky, the furthest away, the last person that we pray for is ourselves, so me. So we begin with the people we love, our teachers, our leaders, the vulnerable among us, and ourselves. So let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for people who love us and people we love, and we ask that you take care of them always. Gracious God, we pray for teachers who show us the way, who show us a righteous way to live and a righteous way to understand you and grow in our discipleship. Gracious God, we pray for our leaders. We pray that they are servant leaders who view their leadership not as something to be ruled over people under them, but as the privilege of serving them. Gracious God, we lift up the weak and vulnerable in our community and in our lives, people who are sick, or homeless or hungry, people who are otherwise vulnerable or anxious, we ask that you give them comfort and resources. And finally, Lord, thank you for me. Thank you for my life, for my family. You know what is in my heart. I ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. 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 This is the time in our service when we are all invited to share what is on our hearts. Where have you seen or experienced God this week? What joys or concerns would you like to offer up? If you're on the phone, press nine to raise your hand, and you may also need to press six to unmute yourself. Carol. Jim and I are celebrating that we got our second COVID vaccine dose this week. And we're just so thankful that we had this opportunity. We're also very joyfully making plans to be in touch with each of, with all of you and to start to reconnect with our families. So a, a very thankful time for us. Amen. Um, Max, I see your hand up. Thank you, thank you. I just want to express my joy 
of uh, what happened yesterday. Uh, we were able to, to gather the church. Uh, Jim led us as uh, it was announced. And we also had the precious leadership of Caroline who was there with us. Um, I, was, I was happy to see Bina, Barney, Tom, Bruce Henry, Leon, Leon uh, 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 Jim himself, uh, uh, and Derek Reinhardt. That was wonderful. I also think I saw Janet Lowe, but uh, it was maybe just shortly. But really, it was great. We did everything that we could. We didn't do it all, but uh, uh, it, it, it was wonderful to meet them again and to talk to them, to be close to them, and to do the work that we had to do. Thank you again for coming. And uh, yes, let's do that next year again. You don't forget Tom. He was there too, working hard. <laughs> and uh, secondly, we were pleased, I, I'm pleased to say that uh, Giselle and I, we got our first shot. Amen. Oh, fantastic. Anyone else? Pastor? I have a joy. I am getting my first shot this afternoon. Mm. It's funny how like nothing happens and then suddenly they're like, okay, call. So, yeah. Well, you better not get sick next week. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know. Okay. It's the first shot. So. Okay. But I know that Lindsay can carry whatever I can. So. Well, I'm getting my first shot tomorrow too. So oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so is Roy. Roy's getting his oh. first shot tomorrow. Well, there we go. Anybody else have anything to share? A tie. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I've been requesting for a prayer for a young man named Ethan. Uh, he's a Fairfax High School student. He's been dealing with lots of uh, things with peer pressure and all that. Uh, this past year and everything just came crashing down to the point that he needed to be admitted to the hospital uh, was it in and his name is Ethan Atai oops I can't hear you I can't hear you friends of ours they happen to live out of state, so it's very bothersome. So I'm asking for prayers for Ethan, for Ethan. God to be with him, help him focus so that he can continue with his uh, school. Also, let everybody know tomorrow, Nyambi and I will be taking our second shot. And all right. All my kids are all ready for their second shot as well. <sighs> Praise yeah. be to God. Uh, Betsy. Yeah, I just want to say that Maddie and I had a pleasant, uneventful trip and have arrived in Ohio, and I am watching service from my daughter and son-in-law's living room. Oh, that's great. Hello to Ohio. Yeah. Janet? I asked for prayers for my grandson, Aiden. Um, he has expressed uh, mental issue concerns to his mother. Uh, who is a counselor, so he's in good hands. Uh, she's brought, bought him several books so that they can have conversations about what is going on for him. But I so admire him for stepping up and saying, hey, I think I've got a, a problem. And uh, so as he addresses those issues, I just ask for prayers for him. Anybody else, any other? And Scruggs. Um, two joys. One, um, John, you know, has been very isolated in the pandemic because he cannot see to socially distant. Um, and he got his first shot on Friday. And also on Friday, Keith um, lost, <laughs> had taken out his four wisdom teeth. And so um, everything went well. Um, so just prayers for his healing so he can get back to uh, playing music. If, if it's uncomplicated, it's a couple weeks. And if anything happens, then it could be a longer time. So thank you. How's he doing? 
Um, he he's small enough now, but pain is pain isn't bad at all. So I'm very happy for that. Very good. Good. So I have one other um, concern to lift up. Last week you prayed for Michael and L, a homeless brother and sister. Um, they are still homeless. They're still um, they left an abusive home situation and they're still looking for resources. So let us remember them in our prayers and pray that they get the resources and the people that they need. Well, if there are no other prayers, let us pray for the church, our neighbors in need and the whole world. Oh God, on this Palm Sunday, we come with praise and leave anticipating Jesus' passion. Help us be ever attentive to your presence in our midst during Holy Week. Help us to see that the crucifixion we remember on Good Friday is present in small and large ways throughout our communities and world today. Enable us to stand with the crucified among us. Oh God, we see so much bloodshed in our world, senseless violence, racialized violence, violence against women, violence against blacks, Asians, and immigrants. Help us to be nonviolent resistors of hate and malice and prejudice. Enable us to be agents of your love in all that we do. Oh God, we pray for the elected leadership in our local governments, state legislatures, Congress, and our president. We pray that they would have the courage to work for the common good for all the people of this country, and that they would put aside differences in order to serve the greater good. And oh God, we continue to pray for those struggling during this pandemic. Help us support those delivering needed aid and vaccines, and let us be witnesses to the benefits of receiving the vaccine ourselves. Help us all take responsibility for every measure that protects us. We ask this and all things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, our Father who art in heaven. heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy, name. thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth, on earth as, it is in heaven. as it is in heaven. Give, Give us this day our, our daily, daily bread. bread. And, and forgive us our debts. As, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For Amen. Thine the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come with palms to praise God and to lift up the way God has set before us in Christ. Christ has opened our eyes and hearts to God's redeeming presence in our midst. Let us give in return for what has been given to us in Christ. Please continue to submit your offering to the church by check or use the Give Now button on our website.
God, may these gifts be a sign of our faith in Christ and a pledge of the loving service empowered by the Spirit of Christ. May these gifts enable your kingdom to come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now let us pray for understanding as we prepare to hear God's word. O oh God, in the power of your spirit, enable us to hear your word for us today in this time and place. Help us to discern what the spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture reading is Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. Hear what the spirit says to you today. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Hear what the Spirit says to you today. When Jesus and the disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? 
They told them what Jesus had said, and the bystanders allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed shout, were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I said, today, Palm Sunday, marks the beginning of Holy Week, which is the most important and intense time in our liturgical year. The rain feels fitting for the end of the week. It doesn't quite fit with the mood for Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is, is jubilant and um, victorious. In recent years, the church, um, the liturgy has tended to combine Palm Sunday with the passion because people don't come to church during the week. But I like to keep Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, and devoted to the palms. And the, the relationship with God panel agreed. Um, that we should give Palm Sunday all of the attention it needs. And I hope that you will join us for worship starting on Thursday so that we can live through the rest of the story and not just jump from this happy day to the happy day of Easter. But for today, let's focus on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. So a little bit of context, a little review of our gospel context here, Mark's audience is believers in Jesus, people who already believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And Mark uses the term Christ, and he uses that as, um, for his translation, he's writing in Greek, and he used that as his translation for the Jewish Mashiach which is Messiah. It means anointed one. So the anointed one from God. So Mark is talking about Christ as the Messiah. And his gospel begins with Jesus' baptism and the voice from heaven saying, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. So it identifies Jesus at the very beginning of the gospel as God's son. And then throughout the gospel, Through parables and teaching, through the events of Jesus' life and through miracles, Jesus demonstrates that he is indeed from God. And also the um, nature of God's kingdom, right? God's kingdom is healing and inclusive. God's kingdom eats with sinners and tax collectors. And Christ will talk, Jesus will talk to anybody. So these are all indicators pointing to what their kingdom of God, the reign of God, is like. And then starting in chapter 8, Jesus starts warning his disciples what suffering is to come in Jerusalem. He's turned his face toward Jerusalem, and he begins talking about the suffering that the Son of Man must endure. And so these are telegraphs, if not outright prophecy, um, telling his disciples who he is. And the disciples, probably more than most, get what he's saying, but even they don't get it fully. They don't completely understand. They have vision, but their vision is foggy, right? And as we approach Jerusalem, He begins talking about the entry into Jerusalem. And his disciples, those followers closest to him, are excited 
because Jerusalem is where the consummation of the campaign is supposed to take place. So they are excited. This is going to be the victorious entrance, and then everybody will live happily ever after, despite what Jesus has told them. Jesus' words are very clear, but they hear what they expect to hear. And so that brings us to today. Jesus is approaching from the east. He's in Bethany. He's on the Mount of Olives, which is to the east. And the peak of the Mount of Olives is geographically and symbolically over the Temple Mount. It's taller than Jerusalem. It's taller than the Temple Mount. And symbolically, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, it has significance. For example, when Absalom rebels against his father, King David, King David escapes to the east, to Bethany, to the Mount of Olives. And <clears throat> Zechariah, elsewhere in Zechariah, um, he prophecies that um, at the end of time, the Lord will come from the east and split Mount of Olives in two before claiming kingship of the whole universe. So to Mark's listeners, all of this has more backstory. It carries more emotional weight than these words probably do for us. It all sounds kind of geographical to our Western ears. But Mark's listeners would know, oh, something's up. Jesus is going into Jerusalem, and he's approaching from the east. And then an unusual thing happens. Jesus says, go into the village. You will find a colt there. Untie it. Bring it back to me. And if anybody says, why are you taking this animal? Tell them the Lord needs it. Jesus had to have arranged this in advance. Jesus has planned his entry into Jerusalem. And he has chosen a very ceremonial entry laden with a lot of associations. Jesus is making a political statement with his entry into Jerusalem. The, um, the colt is a usual animal to be ridden. These days, when we think of a donkey, we think it's humble and, and um, kind of a lowbrow means of transportation. At the time, in the context, it would have been completely normal especially for uh, someone of high status, especially for uh, a king or a visiting dignitary. The fact, the detail that the cult has never been ridden implies that it is appropriate for ceremonial service. It's like a virgin cult. It's never been ridden, it's never been yoked. So this is the first time that the cult will be put into service. And that service is to carry Jesus into Jerusalem. Now, heading into Jerusalem at Passover is not an unusual thing. Um, Passover is the busiest time for pilgrims to visit Jerusalem. So it's not unusual that this group of believers is traveling into the city. There would have been a lot of people traveling into the city, but they would have been on foot. And Jesus, by riding a colt, puts himself physically above, elevates himself above his disciples, above the other travelers. And the disciples even go so far as to put garments, put their cloaks over the colt. So Jesus isn't sitting directly on the skin, but he's not going to end up smelling like colt. He's going to, the coats, the cloaks are going to smell like colt. So they are serving him. They are, are um, doing, making special preparations for him. And so here's Jesus riding on a colt that is 
robed in servants' cloaks, servants' garments. And as people see him, they're excited and they begin strewing the path with um, greens that they have cut, leaves that they have cut from the fields, which is not usual for a pilgrim. Pilgrims don't greet each other by strewing greens in each other's paths. And so that's a, um, it's a sign of respect. It's a triumphal already right there. That's a triumphal way to welcome someone into the city. And not only do they spread greens, but they lay down their, their cloaks for the donkey to walk on. That is a very humble, a very humbling act of service to do. So the people in the crowds are jubilant to see Jesus. They're so excited. They're taking off their clothes and, and making a, a special path for him. And then they are singing. They are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the son of David who returns to Jerusalem. And Hosanna is save now. Save now, please. And then they're invoking the son, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the Messiah. Blessed be the one who cut the son of David. That's the king returning to, to claim the rightful throne over Israel. So there are political implications here. There are religious implications here. There are personal implications. Save us. Save us now. Save us politically. Save us spiritually. Save me from my situation. But save them from what? This time in Jerusalem is the pilgrimage for Passover. People are returning to the city to remember the Passover. And the original Passover, you will recall, was in G in Egypt, <clears throat> while the Hebrews were still slaves. And we'll review this story on Thursday with Maundy Thursday and the Lord's Supper that the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt and Pharaoh would not, Pharaoh would not let them go. Moses comes and pleads their case and God tells Moses, tell the people, to prepare a meal, to prepare a lamb, an unblemished lamb. And before you eat it, before you cook it, when you butcher it, paint your doorposts and the lintel with the blood of the lamb. Because I will come to Egypt tonight. I will take the firstborn males, all of them animals and human. But if I see the blood of the lamb painted on your door and your lintel, I will pass over that house. So the original Passover was freedom from, is associated with freedom from slavery in Egypt. It was the night that the Hebrews were saved from slaughter by the Lord. And so in Thanksgiving, the Jews remember this deliverance from God. And they continue to live, remember it thousands of years later at Jesus' time. But what are the people in Jesus' day? What, are, what do they need saving from? Well, they're not under slavery in Egypt, but they are under Roman occupation. The Romans have occupied Israel and their religious leaders are in service to the government, to the governor. So, um, so we have Pilate, who is the Roman governor, and he steps up his presence in Israel, because in Jerusalem, because it is Passover. And so the military 
the government wants to make sure that they are visible, that their force and power is visible so that this unusual capacity of the Jews, this, that this unusual mass of the Jews doesn't get any ideas about throwing things over. And Caiaphas, the high priest, the Jewish high priest is in service to the Roman government. So Caiaphas, the religious institution, they also don't want the rabble getting any ideas about overthrowing the government or over taking over worship. And the Jews, the people who are neither employed by the Roman government nor by the, the religion, Judaism, institutional Judaism in service to the Roman government, those people, the people like us, they want saving from their occupiers, their political occupiers, and the religious occupiers who are supposed to be on their side but are in service to the Romans. They suffer from Roman rule. They pay taxes, they pay unwieldy taxes. They are second class citizens in their own country. They are not free to worship. They need saving and they want saving now. And so today, as we observe Palm Sunday and we sing Hosanna and shout Hosanna, what do we want saving from? Why are we happy to see Jesus? Why are we happy to anticipate Jesus' entry into our church, into our lives? What does our Savior look like? What do we expect from a savior? We want deliverance from disease, obviously, especially COVID. We want delivery from injustice or poverty, depression or mental illness, anxiety. What is going on in your life today? that you want salvation from. So the lead up to Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, the kind of savior that the Jews, even the disciples maybe are expecting is a military one. Traditionally, the Messiah is a warrior who comes in with great power and a mighty army and smites the enemy and routes them out and, and takes possession, political and military possession of the land and the people. Only this time, the savior will be on the people's side. So that's what they're expecting. And Jesus kind of sets this up, right? With his entry into Jerusalem. He, this is a victorious parade. The Greek is parousia which in later gospels and in later theology, we, we translate or, or use as a term for the second coming when Jesus returns and, and raises us off from the dead. But parousia is a victory parade. It's the conquering hero coming home to the adoring crowds. And that's what this looks like. Jesus entering Jerusalem to praise and, and palms and cloaks on the ground. But what is Jesus offering? What sort of salvation does Jesus really bring? And why do his people's opinion change so quickly? Like the disciples in the chapters before, Jesus says clearly who he is and what is to come. 
and the disciples hear what they expect to hear. And the people on the streets that Palm Sunday, they have their expectations. They've already filled in the blanks. And here is Jesus. It's like love at first sight. When you see someone and, and something about them just really clicks for you and you make all of these assumptions, you project all of these assumptions on them. But you don't really know who they are yet. And even into a relationship, we can still continue to hear what we want to hear. We can still continue to hear what we expect to hear rather than what the person is saying. And so what happened between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? Imagine, imagine yourself there, a follower of Jesus. You don't know the rest of the story yet. You have just heard this wonderful prophet who will eat with anybody who's promising peace and restoration and fulfillment in the kingdom. This is a vision you can believe in. And He's entering Jerusalem in a parousia, in a victory parade. He tells you to go get a cult. What's your, what's your feeling? You get to go get the cult. You go get the cult and someone says, just as Jesus predicted, they say, why are you taking the cult? And you say, the Lord needs it. And they're like, okay. Everything is happening just the way it's supposed to. You bring the cult back. It's perfect. You throw your cloak on it. You're in. You actually know Jesus. You've eaten with him. You're parading into Jerusalem, and everybody gets it. They all see how wonderful he is, and he's your friend. They're all happy. Strangers are throwing greens on the ground, throwing their cloaks on the ground. It's a pretty proud moment, right? What if you were there knowing what you know? What if you were with Jesus on Palm Sunday and Jesus says, Mary Ellen, Go into the village, untie a colt, and bring it to me. Nyambi, go into the village and bring me the colt. Frank and Irma, go into the village and bring me the colt. I know my stomach would sink. I know I would be like, oh, really? So what happened between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? What disconnect happened between the people's expectation and understanding of what was going on on Palm Sunday and Good Friday? Their expectations, their projections of what a Messiah was, a military victor, someone who would crush the empire. They were disappointed. Jesus, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David, comes and is exactly what and who he's been saying he is all along. And finally, the people get it a glimpse of it, and that is not what they want. They want the military hero. And so they turn on him.
this disillusionment isn't unusual. We're familiar with it today, right? We elect new leaders and somehow they disappoint us. And sometimes we stick with them through thick and thin. We've got the big picture. And sometimes we feel betrayed and we disengage, we leave. We leave the party, we leave the, the organization. We call a new pastor and they surprise or disappoint you in some way. And so you distance yourself from the church, from the congregation. Or you church shop for some other place that feels more at home, a better fit. As Christian disciples, what are you going to do? What are we going to do when we bump up to a call from Jesus that we don't like? It's not what we thought. It's not all love and flowers and kumbaya, but it's hard. It's taking a stance. It's knowing who we are, who Jesus wants us to be, and taking a stance. Even if it's unpopular, even if it costs us something. Can you take it? Can you stay with it? Can you remain engaged? Can you witness to our Savior, witness to Christ's teachings and who Christ wants us to be, who we were created to be in his image, even at the risk of death. Let us join in affirming the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the creator who made all things, who set me on my path in this world. I believe in God, the savior, who is one with the creator, who rescued me and all creation from the depredations of our violations against God and creation. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, walked a path through this world taking on human form, having been born a woman through the power of the Holy Spirit. He lived and worked in this world among people just like me. He walked our God's path to death on a cross and rose from the dead to open our pathway to eternal life. I believe in God, the Holy Spirit, my counselor and guide who is one with the creator and the Christ, who through the body and blood of Jesus brings me into communion with all people, past, present, and future, who calls me to walk a sacred way of life through this world, caring for creation and the people I meet on the way, loving them, helping them, welcoming them without prejudice, being God's hands and feet in the world. Amen. And now <clears throat> let us join our voices in singing our closing hymn. Oh, love, how deep, how broad, how high.
And now, my friends, as we prepare to leave this time and space together, let us recall that we are a people who are gathered and sent. We are gathered to be nourished on God's words and sacraments, and then we are sent out to be God's hands and feet in the world. And so wherever you go this week, consider that God is sending you. Wherever you find yourself this week, consider that God is placing you there so that the love of Christ that dwells in your heart can reach out and witness to those around you. And may the, the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and always. Let God's people say, Amen. You're welcome to unmute yourselves. I'm going to